Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Actually, episode number 270. It's hard to believe we've been together creating content to help you live better with kidney disease. 270 videos now. Now, tonight, we're going to be talking about some pretty amazing new drugs that are out there that can help people with kidney disease, especially those that, like me, could use dropping some pounds. Now, to talk about these new drugs and the benefits for kidney patients, we're going to have an expert with us, the author of what I tell you guys is the number one book for kidney patients. It is called Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, and you can get your own copy at Amazon by going to go.dadvicetv.com slash book. This book makes it so easy to learn about kidney disease, to know what you should not be worried about, what you want to worry about, and what you need to keep an eye on. It makes it just so, so simple. And I'll tell you, when I was diagnosed with kidney disease, I wish my doctor would have handed me a copy of this book. It would have saved me a year of worrying, trying to figure out what I needed to be eating. I was focused on so much stuff, so much nitty gritty that I really didn't need to focus on. And I, I you know, a lot of things it says, hey, do this, 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 this. I was doing them. And that's what helped me improve my overall health as I continue to live a great life with kidney disease. But our guest is the author, Dr. Steven Rosansky. Let's go ahead and bring him on. Hey, Doc, how you doing? I'm doing well, James. Always good to be on your show. I really appreciate the opportunity to bring some really hopefully useful information to your viewers. And I'm excited about tonight's show. Very excited. Because I know uh, having weight problems is, is a massive, massive issue for people around the world. And uh, we're going to see how weight connects to kidneys, how sugar connects to kidneys, things that a lot of you folks may have some idea about, but I'll hope to clarify it. Awesome. Um, well, let's go ahead and jump right on into the stuff so we have even more time for questions at the end. And for everyone out there, go ahead, type in your questions for Dr. Rosansky in the comments. We try to get to as many of them as we can after he goes over his presentation and the information that he's here to share. Um, pretty much nothing's off limits, so go ahead and type in your questions. All right, Doc, you want I am ready to, to learn. I've got you a doctor's me? appointment tomorrow with, with my doctor. I have not been doing good with my weight, so it's a great topic for tonight. I'm a stress eater, and I'll tell you, the last two years, you know, losing my job, needing to relocate to a different state, worrying about, holy cow, I got two houses that I'm paying for, one I'm not living in. All of that just caused me to blah, 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 eat, 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 eat. Love my carbs, which I know I shouldn't, but they were so easy, and now I'm at a point where I got to get my weight back under control. So I'm excited for tonight. Uh, should I introduce my background real quickly, James? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so basically I have a, uh, over 40 years of experience treating people with uh, kidney disease. Uh, I uh, am both a practitioner as well as a researcher. I have over 100 peer-reviewed pu publications. Uh, I've done uh, original work on the issue when to start dialysis and uh, lots of work on uh, factors that relate to progression of kidney disease. And we're going to talk about uh, how weight relates to progression of kidney disease tonight. So um, obesity is a massive problem. Everybody uh, who's listening to this show knows what a big problem it is. And just to give you some numbers, one in five of our kids are obese. Three out of four of us adults are obese. Uh, it, is, it is a big problem and obesity uh, has lots of uh, potential problems that it relates to. It relates to, let me see if I'll quiz you, James. Oh what boy. thing, <laughs> give me, give me some of the things, some of the bad health things that relate to uh, being overweight. Well, 
I'm going to say high blood pressure is a common problem. People are overweight, oh. um, heart disease, which is a huge risk factor for those with kidney disease. Um, well, and you're just not as active. Some things are difficult to do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you're not exercising as much. Maybe it's not as easy to exercise. So you do less of it. Mm -hmm. Um, is that good enough doc? We've got a couple others. Uh, actually overweight relates to diabetes, relates to high cholesterol, relates to sleep apnea. Oh. You know, people have trouble with, they stop breathing at night. It relates to strokes, heart attacks heart failure, as well as arthritis. So lots of, and <laughs> infertility. So there's lots of things related to being overweight. And um, one thing that a lot of folks don't know the link to is it relates to kidney disease. So being overweight does relate to having kidney disease. And the good news is that weight loss, even a modest weight loss, like five to 10% of your weight loss. So if you're 250 pounds, if you can lose 25 pounds, you can have a major effect on your health. And if you can maintain it, you can lower your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol, uh, reduce your risk of diabetes, decrease your chances of having a stroke, all important things, uh, and decrease your overall mortality. And for those of you watching tonight, losing weight can actually help slow progression of kidney disease. And that's what everybody here is really concerned about. So how do we define uh, obesity? Um, the rough measure of obesity is called the BMI. BMI. BMI is overused. Uh, and we're going to talk in a minute why uh, some people can have a high BM BMI and not be at risk of the things that we just mentioned. BMI is a hard thing to calculate. Uh, it's, it's things, numbers that we don't use in this country, kilograms and centimeters or meters. So it's basically your weight in kilograms divided by your height in centimeters squared. So, um, and the, you can easily put, plug that number in, you get on the internet, you put your height and weight in and it'll give you B, your BMI roughly over 30 is obese. Uh, who would qualify for that uh, being over 30? Let's say you're around 5'6", 5'5", 5'6", 5'7", and you're over 2'10", 2'20", you're probably in, in that category. Um, are there healthy obese patients? One of the things that's been debated is, you know, is everybody with a BMI over 30 at risk. And you're not all at risk just because your BMI is over 30. There are people that are healthy, obese people. And uh, how do you know if you're one of them? When you get your blood sugar done, if your fasting sugar is perfectly normal, you don't have any abnormality of your fasting sugar, you don't have an abnormality of a two hour postprandial sugar, or your A1C, which diabetics are real familiar with. If all that's normal, and if you don't have a real big midsection, if your waist uh, is relatively small compared to your hips, you're at a lower risk. The, the, the bad fat is the fat around your waist. If you've got most of your fat around your waist and you got small hips, you're at risk. If it's the other way around, bigger hips, smaller waist, you may be a healthy uh, person with a BMI over 30. And if your blood pressure is in a normal range. Unfortunately, those of you who are over 40, it's unlikely that your BMI over 40, unlikely that you're, a, you're gonna be a healthy obese pa uh, patient. Now, what about uh, obesity and, and kidney disease? We're going to talk about these game changer drugs later in the talk uh, that can lead to significant weight loss as well as slowing your decline of kidney function. If you are overweight, your risk of kidney disease is three to four times someone who's got normal weight. So it's a risk factor for having kidney disease. It's also a risk factor 
for progression of kidney disease. And this is for anybody, whether you're diabetic or not. Uh, and it also relates to having the thing that we talked about in several of our shows, having albuminuria. Higher weight relates to having more protein in the urine. Now, how does having higher weight or eating more, how does it affect your kidney? Why does it relate to kidney damage? We don't really know. I'll give you a couple of theories. Um, there's something that we've known for years, a theory about kidney damage. It's called hyperfiltration. In other words, we all measure our GFR, glomerular filtration, right? If you've got a kidney that hyperfiltrates, too much filtration gonna, is going to damage your kidney. We know that for animal from animal models. And so one theory for eating a lot is uh, you get more filtration. And as you get more filtration and damage your kidney, that causes insulin resistance. What does insulin resistance lead to? Higher blood sugar. And the higher blood sugars are not good. They stimulate your sympathetic nervous system, the flight or uh, the fight or flight system, raise your blood pressure, stress your heart out. And other things that sugar can do to your body is they can cause, uh, they call advanced glycation end products. Big word. What does it mean? It means that the sugar attaches to proteins. And even the things in your nucleus, the DNA, the RNA, the messenger RNA, and it attack, attaches to lipids. And these, uh, these, per, these compounds that have glucose attached to them have been correlated with damage in the diabetic to their eyes, to their kidneys, and to their nerves. So that's just one of the theories. Another theory is you get a lot of sugar. What does the kidney do? The, the kidney tries to reabsorb that sugar. It works hard and it probably leads to some damage to the kidneys. Um, how do we know that glucose diabetes with or without uh, diabetes is, uh, is a bad thing? We know that roughly half of diabetics are going to get some kind of kidney problem. So that probably relates to the sugar level. We also know that roughly half of all people that go on dialysis are diabetic. So this sugar issue and diabetes is a massive problem for the kidney disease world. We also know that eight out of 10 diabetics are going to have obesity, trouble with their blood pressure and trouble with their lipids, the cholesterols. So, uh, high sugars and diabetes uh, cause are giving you a lot of risk for getting kidney disease as well as heart disease. So how do we know if you're one of these people that has an abnormal fasting sugar and your doctor pointed it out, how do you know whether or not your elevated sugar uh, is giving you a kidney problem? James, if you are now my doctor, and I and you find out that I have an abnormal fasting sugar and you're smart enough to know that this can relate to me having a kidney problem, what do you do? Am I and I'm taking a guess, am I looking for protein in your urine? Absolutely. And simple thing we talk about every day. Your GFR? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. I thought it'd be you something got, else. <laughs> you got, you got, not a trick question. Not okay. a trick. You thought I was going to trip you up there, but this was not a trick question. Uh, so what you need is what we, everybody gets their blood work done. They now, get when their, you're diabetic, do they automatically keep an eye on your GFR? Or is that something that you should ask? Well, that's, a, a, check. Good, that's a good question. So let's dig in a little bit to this question because this is crucial. Um, kidney problems, there's two, there's two sides to the coin. One side to the coin is GFR. The other side to the coin is the albuminuria, the protein in the urine. We don't talk about protein anymore. We just talk about the albumin, a type of protein. And the way that's measured, the best way to measure it, and please go over the, uh, 
the proteinuria discussion uh, at uh, Dad Vice TV. It was it was well received and well worth your time to listen to it. Um, the albumin, the urine albumin, over divided by the urine creatinine, is the easiest way to measure how much albumin is in the urine. Doesn't matter whether you're on diuretics. Doesn't matter if you drink a lot or you don't drink a lot of water. It's a safe, easy, quick way to find out if you're at risk. You got the, you got the kidney problem. What actually happens, James, do you think, when you go to the doctor's office? What do doctors actually do for most people? What do they do? They tell you to drink more water, exercise more, and just come back in six months, right? <laughs> Is that what you're looking for? Is that like the standard? <laughs> I like that. Okay. Well, <laughs> so um, what doctors do, they'll check your blood pressure. They'll check your EGFR. And they'll try to lower your blood pressure. Most docs are pretty good at that. And lowering blood pressure is going to help decrease the kidney problems of diabetics, maybe decrease the eye problems of diabetics, and maybe decrease the nerve problems, the neuropathy, and maybe even decrease the protein in the urine. But what don't they do, James? <laughs> what don't they do? <laughs> I what don't know what you're looking for. Do? What don't they do? You just well, they really me. don't treat kidney oh, disease or what, educate what, you on what you need to do, like no. diet. Not a trick question. You already answered it. When I asked you to be the doctor, what did you say you were going to measure? EGFR and? Yeah. And your and, urine. So you're going to pee in a cup, protein in right. your urine. Right. Only one out of 10 people ever get the urine test. Oh. It is horribly disappointing, James. And it is bad practice, bad news, and bad for all your patients that are listening. They got to get an easy pee in a cup thing. At least get a dipstick urine that we've talked about many yeah. times and go and look at that urine protein discussion on dad advice. You could buy your own dipsticks. They're easy to measure the urine protein. Now, why don't um, they do it? Is it is it a cost it's, it's issue? Not knowledgeable. It's just it's a knowledge gap. Oh. And your your viewers need to tell their docs, hey doc, what's my urine protein? Don't let them get away with it. Okay, that's not that's that should be bad enough. But it gets a little bit worse, and I'm starting to get blurry. Can you still? That's you okay. Can we can still together? hear you. We're good. Oh, I don't know why this happens. Anyway, um, only one in five, if they do have the protein in the urine, get the two drugs that we talked about ad nauseum. What are the two types of drugs, James? Aces and arms. And we're not going to go through the list. You can hear many discussions anytime we've talked about proteinuria you can hear about all the aces and arms these drugs have been around over 20 years we know they'll decrease the albuminuria the protein in the urine uh, now and we know they're safe we know the be... side effects so they're easy to to live with yeah yeah and and i would generally be in favor more of using the arbs because some people and the ARBs again, and in TAN, like Losartan, okay? I would rather use the ARBs than the ACEs because ACEs can give you the cough. They can give you swelling around your mouth and trouble breathing. They're, they're all cost about the same and we know they do the same thing. So you need, if, you've, if you're one of these folks that's got that protein in the urine, the albuminuria, you need to be on the maximum dose that you can tolerate of an ACE or an ARB. And that could decrease that protein by 50%, which will have a major effect on slowing progression, keeping you off dialysis. We know that. It's been proven. And in order to uh, get the most benefit, you also should be on a low-salt diet to maximize the effect of the ACE or the R. Now, if you happen to be one of these folks, diabetic, uh, with protein in the urine, uh, you're going to be at risk for uh, several problems. You're going to be at increased risk for the thing that James knows well, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. AKA you, hardening of the arteries. 
Yes, add a boy, James. Whether you've got a decrease in your EGFR or increase in your albumin, especially when you have both a decreased GFR and increased albumin, that risk of heart attack, strokes, you know, poor blood supply to your extremities goes up big time. Now, there's another really big problem. Let's just say that your doc starts the ACE or the ARB. Um, what is a common problem that you think that patients will face after they had that started? There will be a drop in your GFR, but don't panic. Excellent, excellent, excellent. James, you're learning. And what will happen? What will the doctor most, a lot of doctors do? What else could it do? Not just a decrease in the GFR. How about your potassium? It, it could increase potassium. So what will a lot of docs, not everyone, but a lot of docs do when they see the GFR go down after the ACE or R or the potassium go up? What will they do in many cases? So I'm going to, I'm going to say they're going to stop, pull back. Exactly. Exactly. So I'll tell you, my doctor, when she was putting me on uh, an ARB, uh, she warned me. She said, hey, your GFR is going to go down, but don't worry about it. We're, it's going to stabilize and we're going to be fine. So she was at least educated enough to know that. And we were keeping an eye on my potassium. And I have the low potassium. It's doing fine. Yeah, I think it's actually helping me. So, James, you're exactly right. And there have been studies of what happens. Five years later, they did a large study of people that had their ACE or ARB stop versus those that didn't. And they had a 60% higher risk of needing dialysis if they had it stopped. It's serious. This is no joke especially when you're one of these people that got the high level of albuminuria. And there's another study with over 200,000 patients where they stopped the ACE or the ARB due to high potassium. Their mortality risk doubled. These drugs are serious. They're important. We can't let your doc stop them unless there's a really good reason, especially if you need them and you've got the protein in the urine. Now, why do diabetics with CKD need them? Because you're at four times the risk of getting one of these bad heart events compared to a non-diabetic. And the higher your albumin in the urine, the higher your risk of getting heart failure. So if you take these drugs, and by the way, the ACEs and ARBs are great drugs for heart failure, for the heart. If you can decrease the albumin area, you decrease your heart failure risk. You slow the decline of your kidney function. You will live longer potentially. So these are important things. Now, James, comes the big question for you. Here's a tough one. We've got 100 patients that you're going to be treating. Out of these 100 patients, and their CKD3B, what is the EGF? Okay for CKD3, 3A, 3A is 45 to 60. And go back over GFR talks. I've given many on this show. And if you're over 70 or 80, 45 to 60 may even be normal for you without albuminuria. Let's say you're 30 to 45 eGFR. How often of 100 patients Will a patient wind up on dialysis out of the hundred, roughly? Oh, it's very small. I know that it's exactly. very out of, small. Out of a, but, out of a but I don't have enough information. I need to know how many are showing protein in their urine. Right? Well, well, yeah. Well, James, you're, you're too smart. But let's just say, let's just all of them, not separating out whether they do or don't. You're exactly right. You're exactly right, James. You don't know. How, and, and I have a chapter in my book about predicting progression. And the biggest factor that predicts progression is albuminuria, protein in the urine. Leaving that aside, i got 100 patients. How many wind up on dialysis out of, out of those with, with the 30 to 45 EGFR? Isn't it below 1%, like a fraction of a percent? 
It's five. Let's say five. It's probably five percent. Okay. Maybe maybe five out of a hundred. I knew it was low. And and if you're if you're three A, it's going to be probably the one percent. That would be my guess. All comers. Now again, you got to put all your risk factors in there, and and there are ways to predict. And you can and you can grab my book to look at that chapter. Now, um, how do we manage uh, these people? All right. How do we re reduce the risk of progression, reduce the risk of getting a bad heart event, especially, and we've talked about this on that uh, 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 dad advice. Uh, what, do, what do we do? We have several drugs. We're not going to get into detail. Can you give me the types of drugs that may help? We already mentioned the ACEs, ACEs and, the, and ARBs. the ARBs. And then there's the SGLT2s. Did I get the, the letters right? I'm going to give you the, the way you know if you're on an SGLT2 is the generic, not the brand name. The brand names are all over the map. The generic name ends in glyphlozin, like empagliflozin or canagliflozin. Okay, I can't even pronounce it. The other class of drugs that James happens to be on is what other class of drugs? Darn it. It starts with an A, doesn't it? Aldactone. Al okay. The aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone or aldactone. There's a couple. Uh, there's a new one called phenerenone, which is expensive as heck, and the plerinone. Okay, those, those are the aldosterone antagonists. Those are other drugs that can slow the decline of kidney function and decrease proteinuria. The last one on the list is what we're talking about tonight, the GLP-1s, which we're gonna focus on in a minute. These, all of these drugs can reduce the albuminuria, they lower your chances of needing dialysis, they lower your chances of dying, they reduce your lifetime risk of going on dialysis. So the GLP-1s, are not just amazing drugs because, by the way, the SGLT2s, the ACEs and ARBs, they not only slow decline of kidney function, but and they decrease albuminuria, but they decrease your risk of dying from heart failure or other heart-related deaths. So these are big-time drugs. And the GLP-1 uh, is a class of drug called glucagon-like peptide, glucagon-like peptide. Now, those of you who are diabetic know what glucagon is. Uh, glucagon is something that can raise your sugar. It can uh, convert something called glycogen to glucose, which is weird. Why would something, which we don't know, and I don't have the answer, a glucagon-like peptide which raises sugar, why would it help diabetics and all the other good things? Well, we don't really know how, but it does stimulate production of more insulin, which will help lower your blood sugar. But the biggest issue is we find that it causes astounding weight loss, amazing weight loss. I mean, game changer weight loss. These drugs are real expensive, but they will eventually become generic and they will be massive for diabetics and for people that are having weight problems. Now, there's a long list of these drugs with really crazy long names. And um, uh, I'm going to uh, give James that list and he's going to add it to the show notes for tonight's show. Now, anyone who is diabetic or not, you got weight problems, you should not just count on a drug because no matter what drug it is, even this miracle GLP-1, you want to maintain the loss of weight. You're going to have to combine not just a miracle drug, but you need to do it with the lifestyle things. You have to. It's not going to, there's no, there's no free lunch. You got to get into an exercise program. Try to do 20, 30 minutes a day, at least five days a week. Try to get on a plant-based diet, get away from the fast food and all the other nasty, you know, uh, red meats and so forth. You gotta get off your cigarette, stop smoking, and you need to 
get your blood pressure to go. Diabetics, the goal is around 130. Non-diabetics, it's around 120. You got to do all those things if you want to get the maximum benefit. So the excitement came with the FDA, not just saying, okay, these drugs are good for uh, diabetics, but they've approved them for weight loss. And the first drug, and these names, I'm going to give you, throw out some names, and I don't even know how to pronounce them. Uh, these, all of these uh, end in uh, glutide, glutide, okay? So the liraglutide, Saxenda, uh, it's a three milligram. These are injections. These drugs are injected. And then the semaglutide, also injected, called Wigovi, or you may have heard of Ozempic. Ozempic is big for the weight loss people, people that are really interested in losing weight and they know about the drugs out there. Ozempic is a big one. These are once a week injections, but they're injections. The big excitement came recently. The FDA approved a one pill a day for one of these GLP-1s, a massive drug. This drug is going to be a massive, massive money maker for the company that makes it, Nova Nordis. It's called <clears throat> Ribelsis. You know, again, these names are weird, and you're gonna, I'm gonna, they're gonna have to give you a list of them so you you know what we're talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's an oral version of that injectable semaglutide. It's the only one that you don't have to inject currently. How do these drugs lead to weight loss? Well, you really don't know. Um, they may curb your hunger by slowing the movement of, of food uh, from your, from your uh, stomach into your small intestine. So you may uh, feel full faster uh, so that you'll eat less. Uh, and <clears throat> now there's um, a lot of these drugs that are out there that are injectable, that may, they're not given the green light for weight loss, but you can probably take any of them uh, at a high enough dose, and it may lead to some weight loss. Uh, let me give you some idea of what we're talking about with regard to weight loss. This is not little bit of weight loss. This is serious weight loss. The studies that looked at uh, this, this injection, the daily injection of Saxenda, S-A-X-E-N-D-A, the weight loss was about 10 to 15 pounds. That's about five to seven kilograms. Uh, using that pill, the semaglutide ribelsis, or Wigovi, crazy names, yeah. uh, there's the, the, about two and a half milligrams per day by mouth. This is an enormous weight loss, 33 pounds versus six pounds in the placebo group. Over what the, period of time? That I don't know. I have I don't have this study actually, but um, both groups did lifestyle changes, so it's, it was obviously over over at least months. Um, it's, now, and and I don't know of long term studies. Anything that you're going to do, and we've talked about this when we've discussed diets on your show, James. If you are trying to lose weight and james knows this well and anybody who's got weight problems knows this well 90 plus percent of weight loss doesn't stick doesn't stick so i don't have long-term data on taking this pill and that's why i emphasize whether you're taking the injection taking the pill you're using one of these magic potions the these glp ones you got to combine it with lifestyle changes or my guess is, I mean, it may, it, we don't know. We don't have the long-term data. My guess is you'll probably gain weight back if you don't combine it with the lifestyle changes. Maybe not. We don't have the long-term data yet. James, here's a good question for you. Mm -hmm. Who loses more weight in these studies, diabetics or non-diabetics? I'm going to guess non-diabetics. Lose more weight or less weight? Yeah, lose more weight. You're right, James. You're on Yay! it. Today. 
And that was a random guess. 50 <laughs> 50, right? Um, diabetics lost roughly, you know, four to six percent of their weight on these uh, studies compared to placebo, whereas non diabetics can lose six to 17 percent. They had higher weight loss, percentage weight loss. That's big. Now, do these drugs have um, the increased risk risk of like a UTI, like some of the other ones? No, it's not UTI, but they have other uh, other problems that we'll get to in a minute. Um, and and again, they're not out long enough. Uh, and so I would caution, like any new drug out there, you got to follow the side effects. And, and they've been out for a while, but not out for as long as the SGLT2 is certainly not out as long as the ACEs and the ARBs. So keep your eye on, on whether there are going to be reported problems. But here's the, th here's the deal. And we know this from massive studies in diabetics. If you can lose 15% of your weight and you're a new diabetic, guess what? Your diabetes can be cured. Mm -hmm. Cured. Type 2. So, huh? Type 2. Oh, yeah. We're only talking about type 2. James, good point. These drugs are not all the drugs that we just mentioned that can decrease protein in the urine other than the, the I'm sorry, the SGLT2s and the GLP1s, those th new drugs specifically not sh tested in type ones. So this is for type twos, James. I'm glad you brought that up. If you are type two and you lose a 15% of your body weight, you are likely going to be cured, especially if you're a new diabetic. So this is game changer serious game changer drugs. So you're decreasing the progress and they are not yet approved. It's going to be soon approved, I think, for decreasing the albuminary, the GLP ones, SGLT twos definitely, the other drugs we mentioned definitely for decreasing protein in the urine. GLP ones, I'm sure will get the same green light. And they also seem to be decreasing the heart uh, deaths. Um, so they will they will slow your decline of kidney function likely and um, decrease your heart disease risk your heart failure i mean they're great decrease your stroke risk decrease your blood pressure cholesterol levels may improve these drugs are great main side effects james the bad ones are pretty rare pancreatitis which is a kind of a serious uh, problem those of you who've had it it's kind of painful and unpleasant but it's rare. And, and again, I've done lots of drug studies and we have to report anything that could even vaguely be connected to the drug. So it may or may not be a serious problem. But pancreatitis and weird thing, thyroid problems. People that have had thyroid tumors may have a problem with this drug. The common things are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. <laughs> because that's- And those all that's, help with weight loss, so it's not the way you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with any uh, diabetic drug, uh, there's the potential for having uh, low blood sugar. And, and as we've talked about, when we talked about uh, diabetes and kidney disease, <clears throat> if you're a diabetic, you are at a higher risk of getting low blood sugar, which can kill. Low blood sugar can kill. I would much rather you have an elevated blood sugar. And as a matter of fact, the kidney organizations, the diabetes organizations recommend that your A1C for diabetics with kidney disease, you shoot for eight, not seven, or not 6.5 because of that risk of low blood sugar, which is real dangerous. So. Yeah, so there's lots of these uh, drugs, and I'm going to give James a list, which we'll put them in the show notes, and uh, and we got some time uh, to answer questions. So I have a question of my own. I was trying to figure it out while we were talking, but I couldn't. Um, are these drugs, these these GLP ones, typically covered by insurance? Uh, I don't know about typically, but uh, my guess is just like the SGLT2s, and I've talked to an endocrinology, uh, endocrinologist friend of mine, uh, she would fight the insurance companies to get them to give the green light. 
So I don't think it's going to be easy to get them. They will probably be expensive if you try to buy them out of pocket. But my guess is over time, they're going to become, I know, not a guess, I know this. Over time, they'll get cheaper and cheaper, and they'll be much more widely available. Probably the, the only the folks at this point with private insurance uh, will be able to get them covered. Uh, I My guess is Medicare, Medicaid, in the not too distant future, will be covering them as well for both diabetes and for weight loss. Especially, I think the first one will be a new diabetic that's overweight. Hey, if we can cure that diabetes and keep them off diabetes drugs for the rest of their life, what a, what a remarkable savings to the patient and to the, you know, to the healthcare system. So yeah. I, I think it's going to happen. Awesome. Um, now as now I've been reading or I've seen articles that pop up in my newsfeed about diabetic drugs that are being used for weight loss that are difficult to, to find because so many people are wanting them for weight loss. Is that these GLP ones? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably GLP ones. And, and, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, news about these drugs. I mean, you know, especially Ozempic, Victoza, these are some of the names. The newest one is, is just very recent, the, the, the pill. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, the company making the, the pill, uh, there's been a massive demand. You can imagine. I mean, I mean, I can only imagine if I was a new diabetic, I would want to get a hold of these drugs, no matter what they cost, especially yeah. if we keep from having to be treated for diabetes for the rest of my days. So, yeah, I think they're going to be, they are, and they will be bigger and bigger with time. I mean, unless, you know, like I said, there may be side effects that will take time to really accumulate, but I think they're going to be safe. I think they're going to be good. Well, tomorrow morning, I'm going into my doctor and I know the first thing she's going to say is you didn't lose enough weight. <laughs> and it may even be, you didn't lose any weight <laughs> in three months. <laughs> yeah. So well, I'm going to talk to her about this. Yeah. And, and James, I think, and we've talked about this for your kidney patients listening to the issue of weight. Weight is not your biggest issue if you are the majority of CKD patients, which are CKD3. Your biggest issue is to decrease your risk of getting a bad atherosclerotic hardener of the arteries event. And that's why I spent a lot of time in my book talking about how to decrease your atherosclerosis, how to decrease your risk of these problems. And the factors that increase your risk, we talked about your GFR, we talked about the level of protein in the urine, but the big ones besides that, which we talk about all the time, your weight is not as, as a heavy hitter on that list of, of, of baddies with bad outcomes. Blood pressure is a much bigger one. Smoking is a much bigger one. Exercise is a much bigger one. Um, and, uh, and, and a plant-based, you know, the type of diet, and we've talked about this. You may be overweight, but if you're, if you're maintaining yourself on a good plant-based diet, you're probably not going to have that high risk of getting a bad uh, hardening of the arteries event, a stroke or a heart attack. So yeah, weight's yeah. important, but not nearly as important as these other issues. Um, well, for me, the good news is blood pressure under control. Cholesterol yeah. looking great now, yeah. <laughs> finally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like we said, try to, and don't accept a cholesterol. And we, when we talk about cholesterol, HCL is no is is old news. It's the LDL, the bad cholesterol. Get your bad cholesterol, if, especially if you're diabetic. And I think anyone with CKD get it 60 or certainly less than 70, uh, and that will help decrease your risk of these bad outcomes. Well, the next time we talk, I'll have new labs, and I'll let you know where mine is. But I know it's looking great. They gave me a pill. No side effects. I take it, and also I'm trying to eat better. I'm just too many carbs, too much snacking with carbs. That's my problem. Well, one, one thing that we should, uh, James and I mentioned this, we talked about this a little bit before the show, and uh, the, the artificial sweeteners, is more and more evidence coming out that they are not good for you. They may actually be stimulating you to have diabetes. 
So just because you are, are getting something that's got an artificial sweetener, doesn't have the sugar in it, don't think that you are uh, off the hook. You need to try to get away from not only sugars, but also the artificial sweeteners if you can. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it took a scary moment for me to make the switch to where now I just drink water. Mm -hmm. um, it's very rare that I'll even drink a coffee mm -hmm. or anything with caffeine in it. You know, this morning I had some coffee because it was a long day at work, um, but I've gotten used to drinking water, perfectly happy. Yeah, I can't believe five years ago I'd sit there and go through two liters of Dr. Pepper all the time. Can't worst. believe I was drinking that stuff. Yeah, the, those sugar waters are the worst thing. And a lot of countries are trying to try, trying to outlaw them. They are health hazards. There should be skull and crossbones on them, just like they used to be on the cigarette packs. They are serious health hazards. All the various soft drinks, you know, and just because they don't have sugar in it and they have an artificial sweetener doesn't take them off the hook. They're probably going to, you drink enough of them, you're going to probably become diabetic. Not, not good news. Not good yeah. news. All right. Let's get some great questions here. John asks, what's the best way to lower LDL other than statins? I would not worry about your diet and your, and your lipids. Here's why we used to be obsessed with saturated fats, unsaturated fat. You don't want to, um, uh, you, you want to try to get, decrease your red meat. You want to try to decrease your whole meal, but going crazy to try to eliminate fats entirely is, is not sensible. The American Heart Association says fats are a very important part of your diet, but you don't want to have the, the polyunsaturated fats that you get whenever you go to a fast food restaurant. You're getting the polyunsaturated bad fats, okay? But the best way for anyone who's at risk, and if you got CKD, you got an abnormal GFR, you got protein in the urine, you're at risk of having an atherosclerotic event. LDL drugs, the, 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 uh, these drugs work, and you're going to get them to your goal level, and you're not going to get them with a diet. You're going to get them to the goal level by taking one of these uh, lipid drugs. Cool. Next one. Raquel asks, can kidney transplant recipients take mm -hmm. SGLT2 drugs? Don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't think that there is an, is a interaction between the drugs that you need to keep your kidney from rejecting, but I couldn't tell you that for certainty. I would ask, your, your kidney specialist or your transplant specialist, if they uh, are, uh, are are they're okay to use? Good question. I don't have the answer. Can too much or can too much exercise be bad if you have CKD? In general, that is highly unlikely. There are rare situations when somebody is extremely dehydrated, runs a marathon and they get muscle breakdown. And in turn, the muscle that breaks down can poison the kidney and cause kidney fair failure. That's extremely rare. It happens, but it's extremely rare. That's why you got to stay well hydrated if you're exercising, especially if you're doing uh, heavy duty exercise. Now, earlier we talked about using the dipstick to monitor your, your protein in your urine. How often should someone use one of those dipsticks? I mean, I think if you're, if you're, you've got a kidney problem and, and your problem is not seriously deteriorating. And I see my kidney, I still see patients in the free clinic here in Columbia. I mean, I'll see them maybe every three months, sometimes four months, sometimes six months. So between every three to six months, not more often than that. And you want the trend. And we've talked about this many times on the show. Too many people get hung up on one EGFR and it goes from 60 to, to 70 and they go, oh, that's great. First of all, 60 and 70 are the same. Anything over 60, we don't report anymore. And the, the 60 is plus or minus 10 or 20%. So 20% 20, 20 of 60 is 12. So it could be 
you know, 48. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and so don't get crazy. You want the trend over months to year, over three, six months, you know, you, and, and, you know, every, uh, every year, every six months, you want to see the trend of your GFR, your estimated GFR. That's why we call it eGFR. It's an estimate and your urine protein. And you, you do want to see the trend of whether these drugs that we've talked about that can lower the urine protein, whether they're working. Yeah. And while that is so, so true, it took me a long time to accept that. I would look at my GFR and go, oh, one point up. Oh, one point down. What went wrong? <laughs> I was on an emotional roller coaster. And now I just look at the trends. It pretty much, well, mine right now just bounces in about a five point range. It's steady. It's, it's stable. That's great. And I feel good. And all my symptoms have gone away. So I'm, I'm happy and continuing to live life and, and do what I want to do. Too many fear mongers out there trying to sell you the woo woo, trying to sell mm -hmm. you the extremely low protein diets with protein supplements, trying to sell you the kidney cleanses, the kidney pills, the nonsense and say, Oh, I've got patients with ZGFR changed from, you know, uh, 50 to 60. It's nonsense or 40 to 50 also nonsense. These are probably patients that have had no real effects of these various things. We on this show talk about what works, where there's lots of data on it, large studies, not anecdotes. A lot of the stuff that you're going to hear about and read about and get sucked into on the internet are these anecdotes and not real science. Don't be fooled. Yep. Okay. Ray, who's a regular over in the UK. So it's very late there for him. And he's been doing a great job taking care of his mom who uh, is going through kidney failure. She's di or he's diabetic. And so is his mom, I believe. Um, he asked, what is the best way to control diabetes? And do you have any thoughts on those pumps? Yeah. I mean, if you're a type one diabetic um, and I've got a close friend, who's my age in his seventies. And, uh, he, he's been using the insulin pump for several decades. These are game changers. The insulin pump is really tough to control your diabetes. If you're a type one diabetic, generally speaking, type two diabetics don't need the insulin pump. I don't know that you can get it covered by insurance, but certainly a type one diabetic, uh, insulin pump and, you know, closed loop insulin pump that could read the sugar and dose your insulin. Uh, is, is a great thing to uh, increase the, your, your longevity, especially for type 1 diabetics. And Deb asks, what are some of the symptoms of dehydration? Uh, if you're dehydrated, and it depends on how much, you're dehyd how much dehydration you have. First of all, um, this came up recently uh, with a family member. Uh, and, and they diagnosed uh, this young lady as having chronic dehydration. I don't know that there is such a thing and, and, and without going into a lot of details, I mean, kidney docs should be experts on salt and water metabolism and simplified. If you have dehydration, you're not getting enough water. Guess what's going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen is what James, what, what response will you have if you get dehydrated? You'll be thirsty. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Your body tells you, I your need some fluid. You, your body tells you, and your kidneys are great at retaining the water when you're dehydrated, but they can only retain so much. So this gets back to the other question. You exercise, you run a marathon, you could use liters. You've got to replace that fluid. Now, are you going to be symptomatic? It could be all kinds of things. The, the commonest thing for somebody who gets dehydrated is their blood pressure drops down. They can feel weak. They can feel dizzy and they may even pass out, which actually happened to this family member. But I don't think it was related to dehydration. That's another story. Yeah. Now, if you're dehydrated, does, it, does that impact the color of your urine? Uh, you can't tell your state of hydration by the color of your urine. There are lots of things that, can, that you eat that can color your urine more yellow or not. And you got a dipstick, it'll tell you if your urine is concentrated or dilute, and it'll also tell you how your urine protein is, is doing. And that's the gravity, correct? 
Specific gravity. Great. Specific gravity. Yep. Very good. <laughs> I remembered it. I like it. I like it. That's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's kind of a long question. Um, I'm going to bring it up here on the screen for you. Microalbumin is 1335, but his protein shows 100 in his 24 hour ur urinalysis. Ex excellent. Which... It's, not, no, it's not 24. Put it back up if you can. Yeah, here it comes. Okay. Okay. So let's break it down. Um, 1335, that's a lot of protein. Uh, that is about 1.3 grams. That's a lot of protein. 100, bring it up again. 100 on your dipstick, it's not 24 hours. That's 100 milligrams. And again, go over the talks on protein in the urine. And I, and I dig in deep to this. The 100 on the dipstick is 100 milligrams per uh, 100 uh, mLs of, of fluid or one gram per liter, which is about what you got, 1.3. It's about a gram, a little over a gram per day. That is significant amount of protein for sure. You need to be on an ACE or an ARB, the low salt diet, the maximum dose of the ACE or, in the, or the ARB. And again, go over that discussion where we talk about, and, and James, I think you put on the show notes on that urine proteinuria uh, uh, discussion, a uh, dad advice. You put the maximum doses of the yep. ACEs of the ARB. You need to be on the maximum dose of it, and you need to be on a low salt diet. And you may be a patient to consider some of these other drugs, the SCLT2, the aldosterone antagonist, uh, but at least for sure the ACE or the ARB or a low salt diet. All right. Here is a question which kind of – Reminds me of your book. Um, one, your book, um, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. One of the most important things I learned in your book was about starting dialysis and when not to start it because too many uh, doctors want to start it early. And Vicki has a question about that. Now, her GFR is seven. How low should she safely go before starting dialysis? And I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to say here. Well, this is a complicated question. And, you know, James, I, I, I was thinking when we first got on the show tonight, I would love to know. Uh, let me back up. One of the main reasons I wrote the book is because I have many, many, many articles about level of kidney function to start dialysis. And I've been recognized for my work. And as a matter of fact, one of my papers was was voted the number one game changer in nephrology in my field. And what we said is starting dialysis early may be harmful. Early in general is over 10 EGFR. Uh, somewhere between five and 10 is a reasonable time to consider starting dialysis. Can you start lower than five to 10, yes. In Asian countries like Taiwan, where I was visiting professor and talked about my research, they had to get special permission to start people on dialysis when their levels were over five. So there are places in the world that are looking for five or less to start you on dialysis. Does that mean that you're safe to start at that level? No, you need to have your blood work checked. You need to be a compliant patient. You need to have a doctor that's working with you. But if you are asymptomatic and you are really, you know, closely following with your doctor's advice and your doctor's working with you, you may be able to wait some, but not a lot. Seven, you're in the range. Over 10, and I can't tell you how many people were starting over 15. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. And again, one of the reasons I wrote the book, I just know of so many older folks that would have lived without dialysis, died for some other reason, that had miserable end of life because they were started unnecessarily, started early with relatively high EGFRs. They were started early on dialysis. And I would yeah. love to know, I would love to know um, it, and I don't know how we could get this from your audience, but if there are folks out there that 
either because you listen to Dad, Dad Rice TV, you've heard me discuss this. If you have been able to delay your start of Dallas, I would love to hear about it. And if you could let James know, and James will tell you how to do that, that would really, it would warm my heart. It would warm my heart. Or let's just say, maybe in some cases you waited too long. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to hear about both sides of the story. So if anybody can get that to you, James, I would love if you can get it to me. Yeah, if they go to dadvicetv.com, there's a contact uh, button up on the main menu and it brings a little form and they can fill it out and it comes right to me and I will forward any of those straight over to you. Great. Now we, okay. we're at the top of the hour. It went by so quick. This is so helpful and perfect timing for my doctor visit tomorrow morning. I'm going to ask about it. I'm also going to later tonight do some research to see if any of them, because I found a list of some of them online, if any of them are covered by yeah. my insurance. That's, that's going to be my first thing to figure out and great then talk idea. to my doctor about any that may be. That's a great idea, James. And the same thing goes for SGLT2 drugs as well that we've talked about. And I, I recommend your viewers do the same as James just suggested. Cool. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Doc. And thank you, everyone out there. I will be back next week, next Tuesday, with Jen Hernandez from Plant Powered Kidneys. And we'll be talking about plant-based diets. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. And have a wonderful rest of your week. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.